It's my pleasure to introduce Cl Christopher Klebanov. Dr. Klebanov is a cellular immunologist and medical oncologist with over 20 years of experience in the preclinical and early stage clinical development of T cell based immunotherapies for the treatment of cancer. Prior to joining Memorial Sloan Kettering and the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy in 2016, he was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute research scholar and assistant clinical investigator at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Klebanoff pioneered the paradigm that T cell subsets with the memory-like attributes of self-renewal and multipotency are a critical determinant for adoptive immunothera immunotherapy efficacy. Further, he resolved how host lymphodepletion, a standard practice for nearly all cellular immunotherapies, enhances the potency of adoptively transferred T cells through the removal of homeostatic cytokine sinks. The Klebanoff Laboratory is currently focused on the discovery and immunologic targeting of shared neoantigens resulting from recurrently mutated driver genes using TCR gene therapy. Clinically, Dr. Klebanoff has contributed to the successful early phase development of numerous T cell based therapies. These include anti CD19 chimeric antigen receptor that would become FDA approved tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy for the treatment of melanoma and other common cancers, and TCR gene therapies targeting epitopes derived from NYESO1, MAGE A3, and HPV16. Dr. Klebanoff is an elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and recipient of several prestigious awards, including the Damon Runyon Clinical Investigator Award and the National Institutes of Health Merit Award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Klebanoff. Well, good morning. Uh, thanks, Nicole. I don't even know who you're talking about. Um, here we go. So uh, it's my great pleasure to talk to you today about a great passion of mine uh, so two disclosures. One is I'm a T-cell aficionado. So I believe that T-cells are the center of the immunologic universe represented here artistically. Uh, and it, as I'll tell you about, is, is really an optimal cell to use for the treatment of cancer. My other disclosures, which are relevant today, is uh, my laboratory has discovered a number of TCRs, which I'm going to talk about during this presentation, which have been licensed to commercial entities. Uh, for clinical development. So here's where we're going to go today. We're going to uh, talk about three different parts. First of all, I'm going to introduce you to a new form of cancer immunotherapy that is now FDA approved, which is the adoptive transfer of T cells. And this is a, a real new treatment paradigm for the treatment of cancer in the sense that you're using a living cell as a form of cancer treatment as opposed to antibodies, chemotherapies, targeted small molecules. We're gonna talk about two flavors of adoptive immunotherapy. One, uh, which makes use of a synthetic immune receptor called a chimeric antigen receptor. So this uh, technology has been FDA approved for the treatment of a number of B lymphoid malignancies. I'll show you a couple of examples. And a newer technology, which my laboratory is focused on, T cell receptor therapies, uh, the naturally occurring antigen receptor that's expressed by all T cells. And this will lead us into a discussion of targeting, and in particular, mutation-derived targets, which I'm going to describe in further detail what I've termed private versus public neoantigens. And I'm going to cite two examples uh, that my laboratory has recently developed targeting what I'm terming public neoantigens or shared neoantigens derived from two very prevalent uh, oncogenic drivers in human oncology gain-of-function mutations in the PI3 kinase alpha subunit, as well as KRAS. So let's begin. Adoptive immunotherapy is a technology that was pioneered by my mentor, Steve Rosenberg, at NIH in the late 80s. Uh, the first example of using T cells as a form of cancer treatment began with a therapy called tumor-infiltrating lymphocyte or TIL therapy, which has taught us an extraordinary amount about uh, how the immune system can interact with cancer and how that can be used as a cancer treatment. The basic premise of TIL therapy is, is really quite elegant conceptually. Uh, it begins by doing a surgical resection 
of a metastatic lesion, it's now known that the vast majority of metastatic deposits, not just highly mutated cancers like melanoma and lung cancer, but also common epithelial cancers like breast cancer or colon cancer, contain within the mass infiltrating lymphocytes that are not just passive bystanders, but experimentally can be demonstrated to have natural anti-tumor activity, but have become senescent or exhausted, uh, are, are clearly non-functional because the patient has progressive metastatic disease. So the patient is taken to the operating room to res uh, resect one of these metastatic deposits. This is then divided into fragments, which are brought into the laboratory and expanded in optimal growth conditions, which includes an immune hormone called interleukin-2, up to treatment numbers, which is typically for a TIL therapy, 100 billion cells, so a one with 11 zeros behind it. And this is infused back into a cancer patient uh, following a form of preconditioning therapy that's designed not to treat the cancer, but to create space in the patient's immune system so that when the the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are infused, they have free access to homeostatic cytokines, growth nutrients. And in many cases, we give uh, uh, a supplemental form of the immune hormone IL-2 to ease the transition of the cells back into the human body. So this can be a remarkably powerful uh, uh, cancer treatment, as I'll show you in the next few case examples. This is patient AR, a patient I treated at NIH who had a very aggressive form of melanoma, termed desmoplastic melanoma. You can see this large, painful mass on the back of his neck. In addition to this lesion, the patient had uh, multiple lesions throughout his body, including the lung, which we resected for till. The patient had till that was grown, as I showed you in the cartoon before, and this was infused after lymphocyte-depleting chemotherapy. And as we were waiting for the patient to uh, recover from the effects of the chemotherapy to have their platelets return to normal, their neutrophils return to normal, we could see this uh, large bulky mass which uh, kept growing back despite multiple surgical excisions, radiation therapies, local therapies, become dry and des desiccated before our eyes and fell off uh, and ultimately healed by secondary intention. So if you read uh, descriptions of cancer from, uh, uh, from uh, the period of the Romans and the Greeks, they refer to cancer as a wound that cannot heal, and that's true, uh, but this shows that if you use the immune system in an optimal way, this can allow the patient's body to heal. This patient's now disease-free more than 12 years after a single till infusion. Here's another example. So uh, the liver is a common site of metastatic spread for many solid cancers, including melanoma, which this patient has. This is a contrast-enhanced CT scan. This is the spleen. This is the stomach illuminated with oral contrast. This is the liver. Each one of these hypodensities represents a metastatic deposit of melanoma. And I'll tell you, there is no hepatobiliary surgeon either at Mount Sinai, MSK, or anywhere in the world that can go in and surgically remove each one of these deposits and leave enough of a liver remnant left uh, for the patient to survive. This patient also had a resection of a metastatic lesion to grow till, received a single till infusion, and you can see that this patient had a complete radiographic response, not just in the liver, but also in the lung. Uh, each of these areas here are not hypodensities, but just the normal uh, biliary tract, and this patient remains disease-free until this day as well. In the steady state, the brain has been uh, uh, termed a sanctuary site, an immunoprivileged site, uh, but we know from multiple sclerosis that T cells can clearly infiltrate the brain. This is also true with TIL therapy, so the brain is another common site of metastatic spread for solid tumors. Uh, here you can see several metastatic deposits in the gray-white junction. This patient uh, received a TIL infusion had complete regression of disease outside of the brain, but also had complete regression of these CNS lesions. So this shows that T cells are not restricted uh, on where they can go in terms of, of anatomic sites. So TIL therapy is still to this day an experimental therapy, although there have been registration enabling trials that are on the precipice of being read out. Um, what has really democratized the field and is now an FDA approved approach is to simplify the process of TIL. So obviously, TIL requires an invasive surgical procedure, 
a laborious manufacturing process that requires skilled technicians. What has democratized the field is the ability to do genetic engineering to genetically reprogram uh, otherwise nonspecific T cells to recognize cancer-associated antigens. And here, this has streamlined the process in a number of ways. First of all, the, bi the biopsy becomes a simple blood draw as opposed to a surgical procedure to, start, uh, to procure the starting material. Second of all, in the laboratory, uh, T cells can be genetically reprogrammed, most commonly using integrating viruses, although we're using non-viral integration strategies that take use of CRISPR-Cas9 and other non-viral genome editing strategies to reprogram T cells to recognize a cancer-associated antigen. And this is infused back into patients, again, after a lymphocyte-depleting chemotherapy regimen. So to date, there are now six FDA-approved uh, cellular therapies that make use of a synthetic antigen receptor, which I show in a cartoon format uh, here, called chimeric antigen receptors, or what we abbreviate as CARs. A CAR takes the antigen-binding domain of a monoclonal antibody and then genetically grafts that into a transmembrane stock, uh, as well as a T-cell activation domain that allows a T-cell to become activated and lyse its target when it sees a membrane-associated target. So some examples for which CARs are currently FDA-approved uh, include CD19, a lineage differentiation antigen that's expressed by uh, the majority of aggressive as well as indolent uh, lymphomas, as well as normal B cells, as I'll show you, BCMA, an antigen that's expressed by plasma cells uh, and a myriad of other targets. So here's an example of a patient I treated uh, with a CD19 CAR. This is a patient who had previously progressed on six different lines of chemotherapy, as well as uh, the anti-CD20 targeting antibody, rituximab. This is a PET scan, so you can see in the cervical chain here a large PET avid mass. Uh, this was infiltrating the patient's uh, nerves, was causing a lot of neuropathic pain, requiring around-the-clock narcotics. This patient received a single infusion of peripheral blood T cells genetically modified with the CD19 CAR, and you can see that this lymphomatous mass, this large lymphomatous mass, has completely regressed. And the PET activity that you see here is just normal physiologic uptake from the brain, heart, uh, and renal excretion. And this patient also remains disease-free at this time. Now, the CD19 CAR therapies uh, have taught us a number of important treatment principles regarding cellular therapy, including the following. And that is that when you engineer a T cell to recognize an antigen, you presently cannot uh, empower them to discriminate between cancerous cells and normal cells. And this is represented here. So here is looking at the circulating T cells, NK cells, and B cells in this subject. You can see that uh, following the lymphocyte-depleting chemotherapy regimen, all of these uh, cell counts went down as expected. But then normal T cells and NK cells reconstituted after the CAR therapy went in. But normal circulating B cells, these are not transformed B cells, normal circulating B cells went down and stayed down as a form of on-target but off-tumor toxicity. So the focus of my laboratory is the T cell receptor, which is shown here graphically. The reason we have focused on the TCR is, first and foremost, it allows uh, a T cell to perceive antigens derived not just from the cell membrane, which is an attribute of antibodies or CAR therapies, but targets that are derived from the entirety of a, uh, either a normal cell or a cancer cell proteome, including uh, proteins that normally reside within the cytosolic or intranuclear space. And the reason we're interested in TCRs is because this can dramatically expand the potential landscape of target antigens that an immune cell might recognize. So at most, 11% of the human proteome encodes proteins that either have a transmembrane domain or a topologic feature that allows it to be expressed on the cell surface. So this means that the vast majority of proteins that are expressed by a cancer cell uh, are below the cell membrane, are by definition not accessible to antibodies or CAR therapies, but theoretically are accessible to TCR-based therapies. And the way that the TCR is able to recognize uh, intracellular-derived antigens 
is because all proteins undergo continuous recycling through proteosomal degradation. Polypeptide fragments from these degraded proteins are loaded into a molecular basket termed human leukocyte antigen, or HLA, and this is shuttled to the surface. So these degraded fragments of proteins uh, are displayed on the cell surface. And this allows us to target not just tissue differentiation antigens, which are analogous to CD19, but a diversity of other classes of antigens, which we'll talk about. Now, despite these virtues, a TCR does have a major limitation, and that is you need not one, but two unique biomarkers in order to understand whether a patient might be a candidate for a TCR therapy. And that is because in addition to knowing if the uh, patient's tumor expresses a target antigen, the patient also must have the right HLA molecule for this therapy to work, whereas antibody-based therapies and CAR therapies are HLA independent. So let's show an example of uh, a TCR therapy here targeting an epitope that is shared by normal melanocytes as well as transformed melanocytes, melanoma cells. Uh, this is an epitope that is derived from a protein called MART1 or melanoma-associated T-cell antigen 1 that is restricted by or compatible with the highly prevalent HLA-A2 molecule. So this patient has metastatic melanoma. You can see multiple metastatic lesions in the lung on the CT scan. This patient had a peripheral IV blood draw to genetically reprogram T cells, which were reinfused back into the patient. And you can see this patient had a deep partial response to these therapies. Now, because MART1 is expressed in common with normal melanocytes as well as melanoma cells, Many patients on this clinical trial also experienced on-target but off-tumor toxicities, really analogous to the B-cell depletion that we've seen with CD19 cars. And this includes a, uh, at times, severe desquamating rash that can look like Stevens-Johnson syndrome. If you biopsy these skin lesions, you can see a dense infiltration of T cells that are surrounding uh, uh, mel melanocytes that are undergoing apoptosis. Uveitis, because there are pigment cells on the uh, retinal pigmented epithelium in the back of the eye, and a particularly disturbing toxicity, uh, something referred to by the neurologist as ocelopia. So it turns out there are also rare melanocytes or cells of neural crest origin in the inner ear that are involved in balance and hearing. And these patients can develop tinnitus, uh, as well as a sense of disequilibrium, all of this uh, requiring uh, local steroid injections. So to summarize the first part of, of uh, this lecture, adoptive immunotherapy is uh, a promising form of cancer treatment that can cause durable remissions in patients who have failed other th therapies. Uh, at the present time, it is standard of care to use a form of cellular therapy, CAR therapy, for the treatment of a uh, diverse group of B lymphoid malignancies, including lymphomas, as well as a plasma cell malignancy termed multiple myeloma. At present, however, cell therapy is uh, very promising, but currently not approved for solid cancers. I've shown you that the TCR is a unique antigen receptor that allows an immune cell to recognize the entirety of the cancer cell proteome, including antigens that are contained in the intracellular space. And finally, I've shown that immunologic targeting of proteins that are shared by normal healthy tissues as well as cancer cells can lead to, uh, at times, severe on-target but off-tumor toxicities. Establishing that a key barrier for the field is identifying cancer-specific proteins that are uniquely expressed by cancer cells but not normal tissues. And so this leads us then to the ultimate group of cancer-specific targets, which are targets that result from the processes of mutagenesis, basically the definition of what a cancer is, a mutated genome. And as I'll show you on the next slide, this falls into two different categories, what we've termed private neoantigens as well as public neoantigens. So what is a private neoantigen? A private neoantigen represents perhaps 99% or more of all neoantigens. These are a group of epitopes that are derived from mutated gene products in cancer cells. The reason we've adopted the nomenclature private is because these arise really as a bystander of the process of carcinogenesis, so-called passenger mutations. Now, because passenger mutations occur at random, each private neoantigen would be patient-specific. 
Now, because private uh, neoantigens do not directly contribute to cancer cell fitness, the propensity for clonal heterogeneity, meaning diverse expression of this protein throughout a tumor mass, uh, can be quite high. This really lays the seeds for therapeutic resistance. The restricting HLA molecule, the second biomarker required for these therapies to work, uh, has no specific requirement. So this can be uh, restricted by a very prevalent HLA allele or a rare HLA allele. And perhaps most importantly, because each passenger mutation is unique to individual patients, the therapeutic targeting of this class of antigens would require a very individualized or bespoke uh, process. So the conceptual corollary of this would be public neoantigens, which definitely are rare, uh, certainly less than 1% of all neoantigens. The reason we've adopted the nomenclature public is because these result from recurrent mutations that are associated with many cancer types across different cancer patients, so-called driver mutations, that contribute to the cancer cell phenotype and cancer cell fitness. Now, because mutated drivers are shared among individuals, uh, this class of antigens should be shared among individuals, the tendency for immune resistance and clonal heterogeneity should be reduced. Uh, and finally, because they're shared among individuals, you can develop an off-the-shelf therapy as opposed to a bespoke therapy. So over the last five years, my lab has developed a strategy to systematically look for and therapeutically target public neoantigens. This is an effort led by Smita Chandran, a senior research scientist in my lab, aided by a senior postdoc, Nyaki Extebera, and just a really outstanding group of uh, collaborators, both at MSK, Cornell, and the University of Notre Dame. Our research and clinical development strategy has coalesced around the following series of events. First of all, we do mass spectrometry to prove to ourselves that the combination of a recurrent driver mutation, whether it results from a point mutation, or more recently, we've identified public neoantigens derived from recurrent oncogenic fusions associated with connective tissue cancers like sarcomas, as well as the combination of a common HLA molecule gives rise to a naturally proteolytically degraded epitope that uh, exists on the surface of cancer cells. Now, once we've proven to ourselves that the combination of a driver and an HLA molecule gives rise to a shared new antigen, we make use of a unique capability at MSK, uh, a technology called MSK Impact, which is a clinical next-gen sequencing platform that essentially all of our cancer patients have at least once during their cancer journey. The purpose of Impact is to look for actionable, potentially actionable genomic alterations, such as mutations in BRAF uh, or KRAS, for which we have targeted therapies for. And for research pay, uh, purposes, we are also now able to elucidate a patient's HLA haplotype. So using this information, as well as a software program called Darwin, which allows us to match patients who are coming to our cancer center who have uh, a specific mutated allele and HLA allele of interest, we've been collecting biospecimens from patients who have this pair to ask two important questions. One is, can we detect a so-called spontaneous T cell response to these epitopes that we observe by mass spectrometry? And second of all, if we do, can we retrieve the unique genetic sequence for the immune receptor uh, that allows a T cell to recognize the public neoantigen? Then in the laboratory, we compare and contrast the quality of these receptors, looking for receptors that have the optimal combination of potency as well as specificity. And all of this is being done with a line of sight to developing a new class of precision cellular immunotherapies targeting solid cancers that are geared for patients that have a specific uh, uh, somatic mutation and have a specific HLA allele. This is a paper I really like from uh, Priestley and colleagues from uh, a couple of years ago in which they looked at the genomic landscape of over 2,000 patients who have a metastatic solid cancer. And in this figure, they're looking at the rank order of the frequency of so-called driver mutations. These are genes that, when mutated, function like a stuck-on accelerator and cause a cancer cell uh, to grow and spread uncontrollably. And at the top of the list is this gene, PI3 kinase alpha subunit. Now, if you zoom in here, this is a so-called lollipop gram. 
So it turns out it's relatively easy to disrupt the function or cause loss of function of a protein, but it's challenging to confer gain of function to a gene. And going along with that premise, is this true for many drivers, the uh, mutations are not at random, but at very tightly defined hotspot regions. And in the case of PI3 kinase, the vast majority occur here at the H1047 position in the kinase domain with the substitution of either an arginine or leucine in place of the native histidine as being the most common substitution. So we began by doing a mass spectrometry campaign initially with an overexpression system and then confirming our results on uh, tumor cell lines. The screen works as follows. We electroporate in into a monkey derived cell line which has antigen processing and presentation genes that are very homologous to humans but of course lack human HLA molecules. We electroporate into this the full length gene versions of the most commonly mutated forms of PI3 kinase along with the most common HLA uh, alleles that we see at patients at MSK and in North America, and do mass spectrometry to address the question, is there a combination of a hotspot mutation in PI3 kinase and a common HLA molecule that gives rise to a naturally presented epitope that the immune system might see? This is a representative uh, mass spectrometry readout for one of these screens. And so what this shows is that the combination of a mutated form of PI3 kinase plus an HLA molecule called HLA-A3, which is the third most common HLA allele in North America, gives rise to an epitope, which we'll talk about in just a moment, but not the corresponding wild type form of PI3 kinase. And if we mismatch the HLA allele here to A69, uh, we also don't show or see evidence of the epitope. This is the epitope. This is a substitution of a histidine to leucine. So this is the second most common substitution in PI3 kinase at the most common hotspot substitution. And here we notice that the substitution occurs in the second position of the peptide, a so-called anchor residue, a position that often stabilizes a peptide and it's binding to an HLA molecule. Based on this finding and the fact that we did not see the wild type form of PI3 kinase presented, we hypothesized that the introduction of the hotspot substitution stabilized the peptide in the context of HLA-A3. And so that's exactly what we measured here at physiologic temperature, 37 degrees. So you can see that the mutated form of PI3 kinase forms a very stable complex with HLA-A3, whereas the corresponding wild type form uh, rapidly degraded to the point where we almost experimentally could not measure a half-life for the wild-type form of PI3 kinase. Now, based on this data, we used MSK Impact to curate a, uh, a library of patient samples to address the question, can this combination of mutant PI3 kinase and this HLA allele give rise to a spontaneous T cell response in patient? So here we screen 14 patients that have different cancer types, different genders, different treatment histories, but all share in common uh, these two biomarkers. And compared with A3 positive healthy donors, using a synthetic version of HLA A3 loaded with the mass spec identified shared neoantigen, we could identify circulating T cells in patients with diverse cancer types, including breast cancer, which uh, is highly enriched in PI3 kinase mutations anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is an extremely aggressive form of thyroid cancer, and bladder cancer, we could find evidence of a spontaneous T cell response to this antigen. We since have gone on to clone the unique genetic sequence of the TCR that recognizes this PI3 kinase mutation, integrated that gene sequence and expressed it in otherwise nonspecific cells to address the question, does this confer mutation specificity? So here is a panel of four unique TCRs. Uh, this is intracellular flow cytometry. Here looking at TNF alpha, which is an inflammatory cytokine that T cells can make when they see their target. In response to normal cells that express A3 but have wild type PI3 kinase, you can see that these TCRs do not activate. However, when these cells are then co-cultured with tumor cells that express the PI3 kinase hotspot mutation, you can see that all of these T cells become activated. They make TNF alpha, and as I'll show you on the next slide, can also lyse and eliminate tumor cells. So here is each of these TCRs 
uh, looking at lytic capacity along the y-axis with normal cells that express HLA-A3 in the wild-type form of PI3 kinase, and you can see that there is no measurable cytolysis. But each of these TCRs, and in particular TCR4 and TCR3, can cause very specific elimination of tumor cells that express HLA-A3 in the PI3 kinase hotspot mutation. Now, TCR4 stood out to us for a number of reasons. One was it is extremely potent, as shown in this in vitro assay. The other is, is that it's CDR3 loop. These are the uniquely somatically recombined loops that project from a TCR and touch the peptide HLA complex. TCR4 had an extraordinarily long CDR3 beta loop compared with TCR3, our, our second most uh, um, potent TCR as well as a panel of over 17,000 TCRs that recognize either HLA-A3 or a closely related HLA-A11 molecule. So to address the question, what contribution, of, if any, the long loop of TCR4 conferred to the potency and specificity of this TCR, we did X-ray crystallography in collaboration with our collaborator, Brian Baker. So this is an X-ray structure showing HLA-A3 here in gray. In the groove here is the neoantigen bound to the HLA molecule, and here are the two TCRs docking and interacting with the neoantigen. And what I think uh, is really quite apparent is that TCR4, with its long loop length, forms this curtain-like structure that envelopes the entirety of the peptide HLA complex, whereas TCR3, with its average length, engages only a uh, relatively restricted part of the neoantigen. So, Beyond just being a uh, sort of biologically fascinating phenomenon, this actually has important therapeutic indications and implications. So this is now zooming in to how this TCR is inter interacting with the PI3 kinase share neoantigen. And you can see all of these hydrogen bonds between the loops of the TCR and uh, the neoantigen. And this has the consequence that if you mutate any one of these residues, to ask the question, can this TCR tolerate unrelated peptides, the TCR completely loses function as shown here, with the exception of the amino acids in position one, which is not interacted by the TCR. So this means experimentally that this TCR is uniquely specific for the PI3 kinase hotspot mutation and cannot recognize any other protein in the normal uh, human proteome. Finally, to establish, uh, at least preclinically, that this can be a, uh, a candidate therapy for the treatment of cancer, we inoculated mice with a form of breast cancer that expresses HLA-A3 and mutant PI3 kinase. Here you can see that compared with a salt water control or an irrelevant TCR that recognizes an HLA-A3 restricted antigen uh, derived from influenza, that the PI3 kinase TCR can control the tumor and if we uh, inoculate the mice with a breast cancer tumor that expresses wild-type PI3 kinase as a specificity control, you can see that there is no impact in the growth kinetics of the tumor. So for the section part, uh, second part of the talk, I've shown that mutant PI3 kinase among the top two most commonly mutated driver oncogenes in human oncology creates an immunogenic shared neoantigen the mechanism of which is that the hotspot substitution creates a preferred HLA anchor residue that stabilizes a complex with the HLA molecule, allowing the immune system per to perceive this target, whereas the corresponding wild-type form does not have this stabilizing anchor residue, and so the complex falls apart, creating an utterly uh, cancer-specific target. Additionally, I've shown you that the long CDR3 beta loop of TCR4 enforces not only potency, but also allows the TCR to be highly specific. So based on these preclinical data, we are now in the process of doing what's called investigational new drug uh, enabling studies, and a first in human trial should open with this TCR later next year. So finally, I want to conclude by showing that this concept of targeting recurrent uh, mutated drivers is potentially broadly applicable in, in oncology. So again, returning to the Priestley paper, you can see that mutant KRAS is among the top two most commonly mutated driver genes in metastatic solid cancers. And like 
PI3 kinase, mutant KRAS is associated with a very tightly defined hotspot here in position 12 with the most stop, uh, common substitution being an aspartic acid in place of the native glycine. We performed the mass spectrometry screen just as we did for PI3 kinase and identified that the combination of KRAS G12D and HLA A11, here the fourth most common HLA allele in North America and the most common HLA allele in Southeast Asia, gives rise to a hotspot containing epitope. We confirm these studies using PANC1, which is a pancreatic cancer cell line that expresses a single copy of mutant KRAS G12D and A11, and found and confirmed that Indeed, uh, there's not one, but two different epitopes that differ by a single amino acid position in the N-terminal position uh, that derives and encompasses the hotspot mutation. But unlike PI3 kinase for the KRAS epitope, the hotspot substitution occurs right here in the center of the peptide. Now, because the HLA anchor residues of this KRAS epitope is shared in common with the wild-type form, of KRAS. We also did mass spectrometry on autopsy samples from an HLA A11 patient who expired from causes besides cancer. And from multiple tissues, including the lung epithelium, we could also elute and detect the corresponding wild type form of the KRAS epitope. So this highlights that if we are to develop a therapeutic that recognizes mutant KRAS, it's not enough to have an immune receptor that can recognize this neoantigen. It must be utterly specific for the mutant form over the wild type form. So just as we did for PI3 kinase, we curated a uh, biotrust of patients who have tumors that express the KRAS G12D hotspot mutation and have at least one copy of HLA A11. Smita, who led these experiments, found that it was only a rare patient, two out of 16 or 13% that generated a spontaneous T cell response to this target. But for these two subjects, the response was profound and notable in a couple of different respects. So this is some representative immune monitoring from one of these two patients. Again, synthetic uh, HLA molecules loaded either with the mass spec identified mutant form of KRAS or the corresponding wild type form of KRAS. And what Smita did in this experiment is enrich the T cell population from these patients either into cells that had a memory-like phenotype or naive cells. And what she found, it was only the combination of T cells from the memory compartment that could recognize the mutant form of KRAS, uh, but not the corresponding form of wild-type KRAS. And this was contained exclusively in the memory compartment, indicating that the cells had seen their target, responded to their target, and entered into the memory pool. Now, the other notable thing about these subjects is that when we did uh, single cell sequencing to retrieve the unique genetic sequence of the T cell receptors that recognize this target, in both of these patients, the response was polyclonal, meaning there were multiple unique TCRs that were recruited to recognize this shared neoantigen. So again, as we did with PI3 kinase, we cloned these TCRs, re-expressed them either into otherwise nonspecific CD8 or helper CD4 positive T cells and cold culture them with targets that express the right HLA allele and either wild type KRAS or the mutant form of KRAS. Again, uh, here we're looking at intracellular flow cytometry with the inflammatory marker TNF alpha. So you can see that in response to the wild type form of KRAS, all of these TCRs with the exception of TCR6 uh, did not respond to normal healthy cells and all of these cells became activated strongly uh, to tumor cells that expressed A11 and G12D. We then tested each of these TCRs in a preclinical model here, uh, a very aggressive bile duct cancer called cholangiocarcinoma that naturally expresses mutant KRAS and HLA A11. And so even though all of our TCRs looked quite uh, comparable in terms of their in vitro activity, it was only a limited subset of our TCRs, in particular TCR4 and 5, that caused a uh, measurable but not particularly inspiring delay in tumor growth, which translated into a slight improvement in anti-tumor efficacy in these mice. So this establishes that we can target mutant KRAS, but clearly need to enhance the potency safely of, of some of these candidate receptors. So we took TCR5 
and did an intervention where we co-expressed the TCR along with the CD8 co-receptor that's expressed normally by CD8-positive T cells. The rationale for this was threefold. One was by uh, overexpressing this molecule, which binds an invariant part of all HLA molecules, including HLA-A11, this can stabilize the interaction between a T cell and a tumor cell. Furthermore, the intracellular domain of CD8 recruits singling molecules, uh, in particular LCK, that is involved in T cell receptor signaling. So this should also enhance the efficiency of the TCR to signal. And finally, uh, because we express CD8 on a viral promoter, we separate it from the normal physiologic promoter that controls CD8, which should allow for constitutive expression of this molecule, which is normally downregulated when CD8s get activated. In these short-term cold cultures, this is in vitro, uh, the addition of CD8 uh, really did not enhance the function of CD8-positive T cells. They were equally able to clear tumor cells uh, compared with control groups. But in CD4-positive T cells, which normally assume a helper function, if we co-express this one additional molecule, CD8, we can turn helper CD4s into killer CD4s, and they look almost as potent as CDA-positive T cells. So using this intervention, we return to our mouse model, again, an aggressive bile duct tumor that's allowed to establish in the mice. The mice received a single intravenous infusion of these T cells. And so now in CDA-positive T cells, uh, we could convert a uh, measurable anti-tumor response into a curative anti-tumor response in these mice. With CD4-positive T cells alone, we can turn a helper CD4 response into a killer CD4 response that looks almost like CDA-positive T cells alone. And finally, when we do a mix, which really approximates the peripheral blood of a cancer patient, we can again see a very potent response where the majority of the mice have a complete response. So now let me conclude with some discussions about safety. So we performed what is termed X-scan analysis of TCR5 in combination with CD8. Uh, this is a technique in which we take the native tenmer of uh, KRAS and systematically mutate each position, all 20 standard amino acids. And here we're asking the question, can this TCR tolerate alternative amino acids at each position? And what I want to draw your attention to is that this TCR focuses its attention entirely on aspartic acid at position six, which corresponds to the hotspot mutation in KRAS, but no other amino acids. So based on this, uh, we can come up with a list of human proteins that have homology to this consensus sequence here. This is superphysiologic levels of uh, the uh, peptide. Here are the controls, the TCR with CD8, the TCR alone. So you can see that none of these candidate off-target peptides, with the possible exception of FRIDA1 shown here, uh, showed off-target reactivity. And then when we created a cell line that overexpresses FRD1, this candidate off-target protein, which has to undergo proteolytic degradation, this TCR doesn't recognize this target, whereas it does recognize the mutant form of KRAS. Finally, using autopsy samples, again, from a uh, patient who is HLA-A11, including tissues from the lung, uh, as well as other essential normal tissues, such as the heart, uh, the vasculature, bone marrow, uh, this TCR did not recognize any of these normal tissues although they had sufficient amounts of the restriction element because if we pulsed the mutant form of KRAS on top of these tissues, they could all be recognized by the TCR. So in conclusion for this third TARP, we've shown that both wild type as well as mutant KRAS give rise to peptides that are naturally presented on the surface of all HLA A11 cells, including cancer cells, but also importantly for the wild type episode, epitope, normal healthy cells. We showed that in HLA-A11 individuals, the KRAS G12D hotspot mutation can give rise to a spontaneous natural immune response, but this occurs in only a rare subset of patients, which I think provides justification for doing interventions like vaccination or cell therapy to create a therapy. We've shown that the combination of a KRAS TCR plus CD8 causes durable remissions in mice. And based on these data, we are also moving forward with this TCR in a human clinical trial, which is going to begin at MSK also late next year. 
So finally, for the overall summary, I've shown that multiple recurrent driver mutations that are associated with solid cancers create immunogenic shared neoantigens that create potentially actionable immunologic targets. Uh, Immunogenicity for these shared neoantigens can derive from one of two processes, which I highlighted this morning. One is the hotspot mutation can create a stabilizing anchor residue that allows the peptide to bind to the HLA molecule. Alternatively, the mutation uh, can occur in the center of the peptide, which provides a potential uh, unique feature that a TCR might contact. And finally, public neoantigens can be an extremely useful research tool. Number one, they can help us elucidate the mechanisms of immunogenicity and immune escape to neoantigens in humans in general, but they also allow us to develop a new class of cancer-specific targets that we are uh, developing, not only at MSK, but also at, at other sites in collaboration with our corporate partners. So with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Smita Chandran, again shown here, who led these efforts in collaboration with uh, each of our colleagues, our funding agencies, including the NIH, and all of you for your attention this morning. It's a great question. So just for the non-oncologist in the room, PI3 kinase has been a notable target in oncology for uh, uh, several decades now, precisely because it's recurrently mutated and show up in, in common cancers uh, where there's unmet need in the metastatic setting like breast and endometrial cancer. There's an FDA-approved therapy uh, that can be used to treat these patients, but because that particular small molecule inhibits not only the mutated forms of PI3 kinase, but also wild type, it can have a lot of troubling toxicities, including endocrine-related toxicities. So because the epitope that we have identified is uh, unique to cancer cells, the epitope contains the hotspot mutation, the immune cell receptors that we've cloned only recognize the mutated form and not the wild type form. So our therapy overcomes that major that major limitation because it is mutation specific. Yeah, so as Dimitri points out, uh, one of the challenges of TCR therapies is that you need not one, but two different biomarkers. You need to know the target antigen, and you need to know the HLA molecule, because that becomes a molecular basket that can present the epitope. And so cancer cells, theoretically, could either mutate or have loss of function of the HLA molecule as an acquired resistance mechanism. The good news is that this is something that we have an awareness of. This is something that we can test for with our genetic sequencing data. So for both cohorts of patients, we've uh, looked for that phenomenon, at least in the resting state. We can see it uh, as a phenomenon, either loss of heterozygosity, meaning the tumor cell has lost one of the HLA alleles but retains the other so that they don't become a NK cell target. Um, but it is rare, it's only about 5% of all patients. So we think it's a low enough frequency that you could go in agnostic of that um, and treat all patients, but at MSK at least, because we have the virtue of sequencing, we're planning on excluding patients who have that pre-existing genetic abnormality. Yes, 
Yeah, that's a really astute observation. So uh, as I showed, CD8 is a co-receptor. Part of the nomenclature co-receptor is that it helps stabilize the interaction of the TCR for the peptide HLA complex. It can increase the avidity of that interaction. We like screening our TCRs, looking for the property of independence uh, for the CD8 co-receptor, precisely because that implies that the TCR's intrinsic affinity for the peptide HLA complex is high enough to overcome a strict requirement for CD8 compared with other TCRs. That's not to say that TCRs that have that feature can't be further improved upon, but if you're sort of looking for a user-friendly way of sort of do we focus here or do we exclude some here as potential therapeutic candidates? All of the TCRs that we like have, have that feature. I think the reason why uh, exogenous CD8 can really enhance the potency even of CD8 positive T cells is precisely because CD8 is normally physiologically downregulated about 72 hours after T cell activation, probably as a counter regulatory mechanism to sort of start to uh, negatively regulate a CDA-positive T cell response. So if you put it under the control of a promoter that normally is constitutive, like a viral LTR, it can uh, maintain that functional avidity after 72 hours. I have a question from the chat. Yeah. So um, thank you, so interesting. Following up on Dr. Kraft's question, are you planning to try this in pediatrics PI3KCA-related overgrowth spectrum where the only target of treatment is the drug you mentioned with many side effects, or do you have concerns about the strategy and choices? I think it's a great question. So in addition to specificity, the other virtue of our approach is that it is a living therapy. And so the intent for, for these kinds of therapies is one and done, meaning you can infuse the cells because every time the daughter cells grow and divide, they carry the genetic instruction manual for the immune receptor. We know in, in other subjects, we can find genetically engineered T cells uh, as long as 10 years after infusion. So I think from a conceptual place, uh, this could be great for a chronic disease like uh, the overgrowth syndrome. However, this is obviously highly experimental. We haven't tested this in human beings yet. So I think uh, just like the small molecule was first tested in oncology adults and then applied uh, to pediatric patients. I think we would do the same clinical development strategy here. Yeah, two great, two great questions. I, to be honest, in the lab, we were really shocked that such a simple uh, intervention that doesn't require epigenetic reprogramming, that doesn't require anything more than overexpressing this one molecule, can completely, you know, apparently reprogram the function of, of CD4 positive T cells. So uh, we're addressing that question right now about what actually is, is happening to the CD4s that allow them to become uh, killers. I think conceptually, you know, CD4s can make a lot of cytokines, including trophic cytokines, uh, that can help CD8s, which might be one of the reasons why the combination of CD4s and CD8s are, are particularly potent. Thank you. Well, let's uh, thank Dr. Kraft and Dr. Kraft.